it, it's my honor and indeed my pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Alan Wolf. How's this? Is that better? Um, when Donald Trump was elected president, we at CJEV realized we had to have for this conference an American keynote speaker who is a very special person. We needed somebody who is deeply experienced in trade and economic policy, an expert, who was very politically knowledgeable, sophisticated, savvy about the Washington uh, policy environment, and who had objective, balanced judgment. So we invited Alan Wolf, and to our delight, he accepted. Um, in the materials that you have, uh, Professor Ambassador Wolf is uh, succinctly described as I think I'll quote it as, quote, lawyer, trade negotiator, and advisor to the U.S. government on trade policy matters. That's a quote. And it's correct, but it's such an understatement, really, of how experienced and excellent he really is and the contributions he's made uh, over the years. Uh, his bio statement uh, provides some basic facts about his career, and so I won't repeat them. Um, after her learning his, uh, earning his law degree at Columbia Law School, though that's not the reason why I accepted you, got to, asked you to come here, Alan, uh, we, uh, he entered the U.S. Treasury Department as a lawyer uh, specializing in international monetary trade and development issues. Then he moved to the USTR, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office in the Carter Administration to be, be a, U, a U.S. Deputy Special Trade Representative, where he was centrally engaged in U.S.-Japan discussions and setting U.S. policy for uh, what the, the multilateral uh, Tokyo round of international trade negotiations with the rank of ambassador. And I guess once you become an ambassador, you always are called ambassador. So I still call you that. Either I call him Ambassador or Alan, I guess, is of my style. Uh, anyway, uh, both in uh, government service and in his private practice, Ambassador Wolf has been deeply engaged with Japan. He was a senior uh, U.S. negotiator for bilateral issues between, for Japan between uh, some time ago, between 1977 and 79. But then in his private practice subsequently, he has been a senior advisor to the U.S. government in the negotiations uh, with Japan for semiconductor trade agreements in the tr 1980s and 90s. And he was uh, deeply involved in the TPP negotiations, as I understand it. Um, I could go on and on talking about him. And they, his office provided me materials. They gave me uh, a list. Uh, not a text, just lists of his committees, assignments, his negotiation agreements, his lectures at public institutions, his public, public article, popular articles, and so forth. It was 25 pages long, just just the list, you know. Uh, so he's he's had an active, busy career. Um, I guess, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, for me, uh, Alan and I met many, many years ago, and uh, he rem and I think you reminded me it was a, uh, at a conference on China, Japan, uh, Korea trade, but I, I'm not quite sure. At any rate, we interacted at that time, and, uh, and over time he became increasingly famous and for, for his, uh, what he's been doing. And uh, then a few years, and we invited Alan to come and be here to, today. And then uh, after we, after some time after this invitation, just a few weeks ago, in fact, uh, we saw each other again uh, when he was a keynote speaker at uh, Dean Merritt Jano's uh, trade conference at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. Um, Ambassador Wolf has prepared a very comprehensive paper for this conference uh, titled uh, U.S.-Japan Relationship and American Trade Policy. Uh, 
it's a very extensive, thorough document, and I assume you're going to be summarizing that, but not we, are, we don't have two hours, so, so we don't we'll get the whole thing. But one of the interesting parts of the paper is he has a list of 18 economic topics which the U.S. should address in opening ongoing trade negotiations with Japan. Uh, I suppose you can't cover all of those here, but I do want to uh, let you know that his full paper will be available on the website and in other ways uh, following, following this conference. So uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to take your time anymore. So let me turn it over to you, Ambassador Wolf. Thank you. Watch the step. I have to. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh and Columbia, uh, for the opportunity to be with you today. It's a great honor and pleasure. Uh, this uh, trade policy, after talking about uh, artificial intelligence, I think is retrograde artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, uh, every, I, the, the conference uh, sponsors know that I revised my remarks daily as new information kept coming in in the last few days, because we don't know in the morning whether there'll be a tweet overnight or uh, <laughs> something else happening that uh, requires a rethinking everything. Uh, there was a time in government service in, uh, and in the years following when I used to commute to Japan, uh, lived more or less at the Hotel Okura, uh, the part that's now been taken down. Uh, and, but it's a pleasure now to reflect on how far we've come uh, in the bilateral trade relationship and to think about where it might go from here. Uh, during the nearly last half century, from 1971 to, 19, uh, to 2016, the U.S.-Japan trade relationship evolved from conflict to a shared vision. It became a true working partnership. There was a negotiator years ago who said to me that, well, we're sleeping in the same bed, but dreaming different dreams. Uh, that changed. By the end of last year, uh, we were sleeping in the same bed, but dreaming the same dream. Uh, that was the end of 2016. Uh, the question for 2017 is, with a new US administration in place, whether that's still possible. Uh, which I'll try to address in these remarks. I think it will be, and I think that it will be a different dream than the one we dreamed last year, and uh, I'll get into that. Uh, what I want to do is cover four subjects uh, today. First, a very brief review, and Hugh has uh, cautioned me to be very, very brief with respect to uh, American trade policy uh, through the last 30 years of uh, the 20th century. Second, the shared effort of the United States and Japan in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Negotiations. Third, my assessment of the likely fundamentals of U.S. trade policy in the Trump administration, which is a fascinating topic. Um, and uh, fourth, I, and I, I said to uh, our new trade representative, Bob Lighthizer, that uh, I would pretend to un say that I understand what actually U.S. trade policy in the Trump administration is going to be. Uh, fourth, I'll, do, I'll address some suggestions on how best to develop the bilateral economic relationship going forward. Uh, the paper that will be available on the website spells these things out in greater detail. Uh, so turning first to part one, a brief historical overview. In the 1970s, uh, that decade did not open very propitiously for U.S.-Japan trade policy, uh, for U.S.-Japan relationship due to trade. Uh, the U.S. at that time had a global trade surplus, uh, balance of payments surplus. Uh, but under a fixed exchange rate regime, the surplus was declining, and the United States felt that it could not manage its global responsibilities, both in terms of defense and foreign aid, uh, with uh, the system as it, as it existed then. 
that the balance of payments was uh, too small. And in fact, I was at the Treasury at the time, uh, there were planes flying gold out of Fort Knox every night to Paris. And uh, the gold supply was dwindling. Uh, the currency was backed by gold at the time. And uh, time was running out on the then international monetary system backed by gold. The US, as you'll know from at least history books, imposed a 10% uh, import surcharge uh, and uh, forcing uh, re the rest of the world to uh, agree to uh, the depreciation of the US dollar. Uh, Japan was asked for voluntary export restraints on textiles. That's something Mr. Nixon threw in that we didn't know about at Treasury. Uh, and we had a settlement at the Smithsonian on December 18th 1971, the President of the United States came, and uh, it was then the Air and Space Museum in the Smithsonian Castle, and congratulated me. I came downstairs and congratulated me, among others, uh, as did the Vice President Rockefeller, on the Smithsonian Agreement. I had nothing to do with it whatsoever. I needed something typed. It was a Sunday. All of our secretaries from the Treasury were at the Smithsonian, and uh, uh, I was on the Canada negotiating team uh, because we had, there were three, the U.S. asked for unilateral concessions from Japan, the European community, and, um, and uh, Canada, and uh, they were to be unreciprocated by the United States. And of course, those negotiations went absolutely nowhere. But what happened was the Tokyo Round of Trade negotiations was started in September of uh, 1973 as a result of the fact that we weren't going to get unreciprocated uh, concessions. Why go into that history? Because a number of elements are repeated today. Uh, there are echoes repeated today. Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, and that is sort of what happened. First, we're once again in the United States concerned about bilateral, well, concern, well bilateral trade balances. Second, we once again have an agenda with respect to specific product sectors. Back then it was textiles, very heavily, uh, and now it's uh, steel and aluminum. Uh, once again, the U.S. is seeking bilateral negotiations to reduce the U.S. trade deficit, and of course not thinking of giving anything in return. And fourth, uh, there was at the time uh, uh, tax, border adjustable tax, called the uh, Domestic International Sales Corporation. And uh, again, the U.S. Congress, some parts of the U.S. Congress, Kevin Brady, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, the Tax Writing Committee of the House of Representatives, is considering a border adjustable tax. So in fact, there are a lot of parallels to what was happening then. A difference is Japan had about half, was responsible for about half the U.S. global balance of payments deficit. Today it's China, uh, $347 billion out of a total $750 billion deficit now. As Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, I was in charge of uh, uh, the management of U.S.-Japan uh, trade relations. Um, Hugh Patrick at the time was appointed quite appropriately to a literal wise men's group uh, to calm the waters uh, between the U.S. and Japan and uh, uh, actually contributed a lot to the relationship as he has ever since. Uh, the efforts to manage the trade problems between the two countries uh, can, uh, occupied U.S. trade negotiators for the better part of the next 25 years. There may have been a mismatch of expectations. I'm sure there was. Uh, in 1992, Toyo Gyoten, a friend from the uh, Okura Show, uh, an outstanding Japanese official, wrote a book, co-authored a book with Paul Volcker, uh, who had been my uh, immediate, not immediate boss, he was well above me at the Treasury. Uh, called uh, Changing Fortune, Fortunes. And what he said was the alliance between the United States and Japan were based upon two pillars, that Japan would follow the lead of the United States in global affairs, uh, and uh, Japan would have a free hand 
to expand its exports while securing stable imports of oil, foodstuffs, and raw materials. Now, you notice one thing missing in that is reciprocity in terms of trade, that the Japanese market would actually not be opened, but it would export a lot, and that was in return for Japan following the U.S. lead in global policy. That struck me as an extraordinary statement, uh, and it was not something we trade negotiators or people at Treasury uh, were thinking at the time. By the late 70s, we uh, created a, a, there was a, a, Mr. Ushiba at the time with my boss, Mr. Strauss, entered into an agreement on an agreed Japanese growth target of 7%, which was totally unrealistic, but it was considered better to have a high growth target and perhaps get the growth up than not. And uh, specific trade liberalizing measures and temporary export restrictions on the side on um, color televisions at the time. That package of measures had relatively little effect. So the 1980s were even more turbulent uh, than uh, the years before. Japanese cars were flooding into the US market when the second oil crisis hit because Japan had small cars and cars that used to be sitting rusting at the port in Baltimore, the Toyotas and the Nissans, uh, suddenly became in high demand. And Detroit didn't make small cars. So uh, there was a major case. I represented Nissan in that case. We won, which didn't mean that there wouldn't be re restrictions on exports to the United States. There were. But uh, it uh, began, perhaps, the thinking, uh, although it didn't ha take place quite then. It took place a few years later. But uh, that the Japanese car company should invest in the United States. And in fact, when they did, that's part of the foundation of a uh, much closer, better economic relationship between the two countries today. Um, a second area of controversy was semiconductors. I won't go into that in a great detail. I still represent the American semiconductor industry. Uh, and uh, we started out with uh, a very uh, contentious relationship in that era because the Japanese market was essentially closed to US product and uh, Japan was uh, creating excess capacity and unloading it on the world markets. Uh, the decade of the 1990s uh, opened with continuing bilateral trade friction. Uh, the uh, unbelievably, uh, it looks like 25 minutes have gone by. So I'll, uh, I'll switch to, uh, that is unbelievable. It's more like 15. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, there was a kendo match, a pretend kendo match, because Minister, Miti Minister Hashimoto was uh, one heck of a lot better at kendo than Mickey Cantor, the U.S. Trade Representative. And uh, the, uh, there was a threat of high tariffs. Uh, but Gaiatsu peaked at that time, uh, and like the cresting of the famous Hiroshiga wave, uh, there was greater harmony. Uh, and uh, creative uh, agreements uh, were, uh, were negotiated. There followed a period of uh, mukanshin, or no interest, on the part of the United States with respect to Japan, nayatsu instead of gaiatsu, uh, as Japan uh, worked to reform its own eco economy, and a feeling of uh, oita kabori being left behind. Uh, 21st century, we had a joint agenda that uh, Mr. Hatakiyama of the Japan Economic Foundation and I uh, uh, evolved out of a conference of experts, and uh, uh, no one was interested. This was 2008. The Obama administration wasn't interested. The uh, Japanese government was not interested in forging a closer relationship, uh, and the is a summary in my written remarks of uh, written version of that joint action agenda. Uh, but the Obama administration did come into TPP uh, in 2009, in November. Japan joined four years later. Uh, and uh, the role Japan played in those negotiations was entirely different than in the Tokyo round or the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations. Japan didn't hide. In fact, it led 
on rules negotiations. It was a very close and formidable partner of the United States in crafting what is, in fact, an excellent agreement. Uh, it played a central role in making that agreement as successful as it was. Um, part three of uh, my remarks, uh, Japan, uh, on January 20th, Japan notified the chair of TPP, which was New Zealand, that it had ratified the agreement. That was hours before Mr. Trump was inaugurated. And of course, as Hugh said, three days later, the, uh, President uh, Trump, first thing he did was pull the United States out of the agreement. Uh, so that brings us pretty much up to the present. Uh, the start of the Trump administration was somewhat fractious in some respects. Oh. Not a very good phone call with the Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Mexican uh, president decided not to come to the United States. It was not a, a warm, it was more of a hot than a warm relationship. Uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, however, uh, did a brilliant job of working with the new administration and um, there was a successful meeting, uh, actually two meetings, and Deputy Prime Minister Asso met successfully with uh, uh, Mr. Pence, our Vice President, uh, in April. Uh, what's the result? Japan is free to enter into uh, TPP with the other countries if they so wish. Uh, it met in Hanoi this last weekend, and uh, the Japan and the United States will continue their discussions um, and uh, whether that leads ultimately to a formal agreement is unclear. Uh, Robert Lighthizer, the new U.S. trade representative in Hanoi this last weekend, was asked about that and asked actually within the last 24 hours about that when he testified before the House Agriculture Committee whether there would be an agreement with Japan, and uh, he refused to speculate on the subject. So what's, what is U.S. current trade policy? under the current tr the Trump administration. Uh, I think we'll look back on this period as sort of pre-appointment uh, of Mr. Lighthizer as U.S. Trade Representative and post. The, pr the prior period, the tone was uh, national sovereignty, economic nationalism, America first, buy American, hire American. Uh, prior trade agreements were all condemned as terrible. Uh, when the G20 finance ministers met at Baden-Baden a couple of months ago, the United States for the first time rejected a, uh, the normal anti-protectionism pledge, the pro-World Trade Organization, WTO language, that's inserted in declarations. Uh, when uh, on March 24th, Secretary of the Treasury Peter uh, Mnuchin said, so long as we can negotiate trade deals that are good for us, we won't be protectionist, otherwise we will. No prior uh, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States has ever made comments of that kind on trade. Uh, in the, I the IMF meeting in April, uh, just decided not to have a, any statement on trade because the United States would probably object. And tomorrow, the G7 summit uh, in um, uh, in Italy, uh, there's a question of whether they can say anything about trade at all because Mr. Trump is there. Uh, in late April, the president was still threatening to withdraw from uh, NAFTA. If uh, He said if the negotiations do not go well. That's after they decided that they wouldn't withdraw from NAFTA. Uh, he came out with a, actually a tweet the next morning saying, well, if it doesn't go well, we will. He threatened withdrawal from the U.S.-Korea trade agreement. Um, the current White House tends to be graded on a curve, which the professors in this audience will understand. Namely, we, there's so much that is uh, out of the ordinary that uh, the, and the, this, uh, a relief any day when there isn't a tweet and when the rhetoric is less bellicose. Uh, Foreign firms and governments know that they should bring presence to the United States, more investment, uh, in, with an intensity that is usually reserved for governors rather than our president. Uh, 
The Trump threat of 45% tariffs on China, 35% tariffs on runaway trade, uh, runaway companies to uh, have plants in Mexico, those are threats that have not been repeated. The 45% was said at a New York Times editorial board meeting, was sort of a throwaway line. It's never been said again. Um, what will happen is selective measures, I would think, on steel and aluminum down the road. Um, the, uh, there is an implication in the President's trade policy message of March 1 that unilateral measures would uh, be applied uh, to redress trade problems. Uh, there's a call out in that document about foreign economies that are on a non-market basis, which really means China, it's code for China. But since that time, because the president wants, the, the administration wants the help of China with respect to um, uh, North Korea, uh, the president, again in a tweet, said that uh, the uh, Chinese would uh, benefit with respect to trade matters in our country if uh, they were helpful with respect to North Korea. Um, the uh, measures going forward are likely to be not across the board but selective. Uh, will there be spill, ba spill uh, uh, back on uh, uh, Ch uh, Japanese? Uh, trade, uh, perhaps, but I think the, the aim is really uh, China. Uh, the, uh, the, the concern within the administration, uh, when they talk about defense of national sovereignty, uh, they're really talking about uh, trade remedies uh, that are not upheld in disputes against the United States in the World Trade Organization. In other words, dispute settlement panels come out against the use of trade remedies, anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties, and that is going to be resisted by the United States in this administration. Uh, but the President's uh, trade policy agenda, which was issued very early in this administration, actually talks about forward-leaning measures on the domestic side uh, lower taxes, less regulation, more spending on infrastructure, and the negotiation of better trade agreements. That's not out of place with what any administration might have said. Um, and uh, the NAFTA renegotiation has been, uh, uh, the notice to Congress was actually also uh, somewhat in the traditional uh, form. To understand this administration's trade policy, there are two uh, touchstones, two guideposts. Uh, one is that success is measured by a bilateral trade deficit being reduced. And that is uh, continuing going forward. I think it won't be with the same emphasis or strength in what could Japan do, maybe bring in more LNG, maybe more uh, oil from fracking. Um, now, that has some currency effects, which might be actually counteractive. But uh, the administration really does like positive announcements. Uh, so uh, lo doing things to lower the bilateral balance would be one. Um, the, uh, the second basic point is that the administration cares very deeply about the U.S. industrial base. Uh, so not every provision in every trade agreement can serve the U.S. industrial base, but uh, overall the objective is to have a strong economy. It's being looked at, I think, in traditional terms, traditional industries, but that will extend to higher technology as well. What's missing? Nothing with respect to working with other countries in a group setting. Nothing with respect to the WTO. Nothing with respect to the Trade and Services Agreement. Nothing with respect to the Environmental Goods Agreement in Geneva. Um, and uh, then w uh, since bilateral trade agreements are the only acceptable format, uh, with whom? Well, uh, so-called bilateral agreement will be with NAFTA, with Canada and Mexico. That's already been agreed. Uh, the next one that uh, would be considered uh, 
uh, it would be the UK, except the UK divorce is not final. The UK doesn't know what its external trade uh, system is going to be. So uh, an agreement with the UK, there can be consultations, but there can't be an agreement with the UK. Uh, would there be an agreement with the EU? Uh, there was a transatlantic negotiation. It's uh, somewhat comatose, if not dead, uh, probably dead. Uh, and uh, I think there'll be selective bits of agreement on pharmaceuticals, on cosmetics, on standards uh, in various areas, but uh, very difficult for the US and the EU to agree on very much, frankly. So we come to Japan, and Japan is the only other major economy in the world with which there could be a bilateral agreement. Um, and uh, that is not entirely unlikely. If we're going to pursue bilateral agreements, then if the United States is, then uh, the major candidate is ultimately got to be Japan. Uh, then the question is, from a Japanese point of view, why don't we just do TPP, uh, take the same provisions? You can take a lot of them, but uh, on rules, because we see eye to eye on rules for state-owned enterprises, rules for regulatory coherence, uh, which means uh, not having conflicting regulations. Whole areas uh, out of TPB, digital economy is something that could be uh, easily, agree easily agreed. But then uh, reality, reality sets in with respect to other matters. Uh, when the new ambassador to Japan Bill Haggerty was before his confirmation hearing. Uh, the various senators said, like they would in any, I think in any country, they said, well, my constituents want the following, poultry, uh, more beef. Uh, somebody will come up and say rice at some point, uh, which is always uh, causes some degree of lack of amusement on the Japanese side. Um, so, uh, it, it's easy to say, well, why not just take TPP as is, with, uh, but there will be things like currency manipulation, which I think can be handled in a sensible way uh, uh, with uh, an agreement perhaps along the lines that Fred Bergson has suggested at the Peterson Institute on countervailing intervention in the currency market to counter intervention by uh, a foreign government. Um, the tighter rules of origin on auto parts. Wilbur Ross, very important in this administration, uh, Trump administration, the Secretary of Commerce, was in the auto parts business. He understands uh, auto parts, and uh, he will want something on that. Um, what the President said recently when he declared, this, by the way, we're in National Trade Week, um, this week, uh, presidential proclamation, uh, and the, President Trump issued the following statement. We will promote our economic growth by strengthening our manufacturing base and expanding exports in manufacturing, agriculture, and service industries. So that's the industrial base half of it. We will also challenge unfair trade practices that leave American workers, farmers, and businesses competing in global markets at a disadvantage. Uh, that's as succinct a statement of the U.S. policy as there is. It's reasonably well considered. So let me uh, turn to a conclusion, and, uh, and that is that uh, there is no partner outside of Japan uh, for the United States that's better positioned to enter into a uh, a bilateral agreement that can lead to a better world trading system. And the agreement that we entered into, if, we, if there is one, with Japan, has to be one that is uh, able to be uh, tied in to uh, agreements with the, our NAFTA partners, eventual agreement with Europe, uh, because the end goal is to do all of this in a strategic manner uh, with, the, uh, with an ultimate ma uh, multilateral end in sight, to have world trading rules that China joins, that India joins, uh, 
something a lot better than RCEP, the Regional Co uh, uh, Cooperation and Economic Partnership uh, does. Uh, no two countries are more capable of embarking upon this path. Thank you very much. going to extend this session uh, until about, uh, for another 15 minutes or so, uh, because we want to take advantage of the opportunity of uh, my asking you a question or two, but also particularly you all asking a question. So I'm expecting an, a question from somebody in the audience, so be prepared. And if you're not prepared, I may stick my finger at you and say, ask a question. So I warn you. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I just want to note uh, uh, that you referred to the book by uh, Toyo Goten and, and Paul Volcker. And uh, as it happens, uh, you know, uh, Toyo Goten was one of the major government policy players uh, in U.S. Re relationship, U.S.-Japan relations, and in a broader way. And he happens to be here today. So I just want to say we're really glad that you're here, Toyo. Uh, the uh, the you, you were making a, a rather positive case that bilateral negotiations could move ahead if in the U.S. because the U.S. Japan prevents us an opportunity. But um, how do you how do you evaluate the shift from multi multilateral to a bilateral approach un, uh, as, as under President Trump? Well, uh, the, I think it's appalling to have the United States, which has led uh, the multilateral effort, really going back to uh, the uh, Atlantic Charter. Uh, there are two economic elements in the Atlantic Charter of 1942 that were agreed to by Roosevelt, Fra Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill on that all countries should be open to trade. And before that, Cordell Hall uh, agreements in the 1930s all had a most favored nation clause. In other words, they were designed to be a support of an eventually a multilateral system. And uh, the U.S. led, although it didn't sign, didn't uh, ratify the International Trade Organization in 1947. We have, we have led a world trading system uh, really from the 1930s and much more explicitly from the 1940s right up until January 20 of this year, when suddenly we abandon it. Uh, I think we have to get back to that. I'm hopeful that the administration will be able to find its way there. They, uh, the bilateral approach it has extraordinarily difficult limits to it at this stage. You can't set rules for the world trading system very effectively bilaterally. Uh, and uh, so uh, Lighthizer said, the U new yes, USTR said, that we are not abandoning Asia, we're engaging, but he's stuck with uh, the current bilateral framework, and the question is how can you stitch back the uh, TPP elements that are disparate and uh, now uh, disconnected. Uh, I don't think that it will be practical for uh, Japan, Australia, uh, and New Zealand to pull together the easily the TPP of uh, 11 instead of 12. Uh, Vietnam was looking forward to selling a few textiles to the United States and, there are no, and doesn't like the rules on state-owned enterprises uh, as well as uh, intellectual property protection and a number of other things. So the, uh, we're limited with sort of a tunnel vision for the moment, and I do think the, a big question is uh, there's, a, there's uh, the ministerial conference of the WTO in December in Buenos Aires. Will the U.S. have a positive agenda by then? And my hope is that we can get there, uh, but that's not all clear. The positive agenda would be 
rules for the digital economy that actually would help developing countries more than anything else we could do. Um, let me ask one more question. Aside from bilateralism, what worries you most about Trump's trade policy? That's a, a challenging question uh, because there's a lot that can go wrong. Uh, the uh, uh, I have actually I have uh, faith that there are elements of stability in the U.S. system uh, that will prevail to reshape uh, the economic nationalism of uh, half of the White House. Uh, in other words, the uh, the expectation of the leadership of the House and Senate, and the House and Senate didn't change in the last election. The, the uh, leaders are still the same leaders, and they're still very much free trade uh, in orientation. Uh, the, uh, there, there are, uh, the, the Congress in the United States system has the uh, commerce power under the Constitution and uh, they are, are going to help actually counter uh, the tendencies towards uh, a deconstruction of the world trading system. And I don't think that the new trade representative, Mr. Lighthizer, has any intention whatsoever of dismantling the world trading system. We could get into some problems. One would be the U.S. adopts a border adjustable tax, uh, which uh, 163 out of 164 members of the WTO would find offensive. I went over to Geneva to defend the DISC, the Domestic International Sales Corporation, unsuccessfully. I tried to explain in a room about this size, 100 delegates, uh, uh, why it was WTO consistent, uh, GATT consistent at the time, and sold nobody on that proposition. Lighthizer went over uh, in the early 1980s to say that the successor attempt to have border adjustability would uh, uh, be uh, WTO consistent and uh, or GATT consistent and failed. Uh, we understand marching up that hill uh, and coming back down again with failure. Uh, but I don't think that test happens because uh, actually uh, the Congress is divided on the subject. There's a lot of opposition to a border adjustable tax. I think there's justification for one, uh, but um, in economic terms, not necessarily in legal terms. Uh, but uh, that would take on the world. You take on the world, you don't tend to win. Thank you.